Not long ago, I reviewed the Bluetti AC2A portable power station. Small, lightweight, compact, very capable for its size, very versatile. The only issue with it is it has a limited amount of power to deliver and a limited amount of runtime. Great for car camping, maybe not so good for home preparation in case of power failures. Well, now I have the Bluetti AC70 power station Big brother to the AC2A, more power to delivery, longer run times. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this unit, keep watching. All right, before we get started, I just want to thank Blue Weddy for sending out the AC70 so that I could share it with you. So what I'm going to do is I am going to take you down to the tabletop where I can show you the AC70. I'll go over its key features, its physical and performance specification, as well as its modes of operation. Just before we focus in on the AC70, I want to share with you what it came with. So number one, of course, is the AC charging cable. And you will note that the charging brick, the power unit itself, is not on the cable. It's actually built into the unit itself. And this is where it hooks up. And I'll show you that in a bit more detail in a minute. That is a great feature. It just means one less things, one large brick that you don't have to deal with. The other nice thing is, should you, for whatever reason, misplace or lose your cable, these are readily available on the market today. It did come with two other cables. Number one is this one, the solar charging cable. So on one end, it has the MC4 connectors, which to connect to your solar panel and on the other end it has the xt90 connector which will plug in right here i'll share that with you in a moment another cable that it came with is this and this is an auto recharging cable so this will plug into your uh, cigarette lighter uh, in your vehicle and will give a 12 volt dc to the unit through an xt90 connector as well and finally, the last thing is this manual and warranty information. It's a good manual, well detailed, a lot of information in it, and a lot of references to where you can find additional information. One that I've actually earmarked here, and I just want to share with you very quickly, is this page, which helps you with the calculations to determine what it is you can run with this unit and for how long. So all the math is there done for you with suggestions of the type of devices you can run off it. That is especially important because, of course, one of the things you want to know is what will it run what can i run with it well i'm going to share you my experience share with you my experiences and the things that i have tested this on around the house it is a much better unit for the event of a power failure than of course this small unit is this is great for small needs like recharging cell phones and tablets and things like that but this is the one you want if you're going to be operating any bigger appliances now i don't mean things like fridges and stoves it will run my fridge but that's one of the things i did test it on but it is, has more power more capability and i'll share those experiences with you now i have the ac2a stacked on top of the ac70 for a reason i wanted you to see one the size comparison between the two but also the similarities that the two have they are virtually identical in almost every way except for size and power capabilities all the operating devices key features and everything else is the same now what i want to say about the ac2a before i take it out of the picture is that this unit is a small compact lightweight unit very good uh, unit for taking places when you're on the move such as car camping or anywhere else that you were going for a short period of time this will not necessarily power devices for a long period of time but it is great for the mobility and the capability and portability that it provides not so great for home prepping if you're worrying about power failures you want to look at a larger unit like this all right let me just take the ac2a out of the picture so that we can focus in on the ac70 now i did say this is a great unit for power failures even today as I record this, we are in the middle of quite a large multi-day snowstorm and we are very much at risk of losing our power sometime during the day. Having this unit gives me a great sense of confidence that I'll be able to keep the essential things running around the house. Now, there are things that it won't run, but a lot of the things that are very important, it will run. Things like my fridge and my freezer, which I've tested this both on. It won't run my electric range, but I'll, well, I'll, let me, I'll share with you a moment the things that I did test it on, the things that I think that is worth taking a look at and worth having a unit like this to operate in the event of power failure. So let's go through the key features. So just like the AC2A, the AC70 has three power delivery modes. It has the standard, 
the eco and the power lifting mode. Now the eco mode is, it is set by default and you can change that and I'll explain how to change that in a moment. And the eco mode is a power saving mode and what that means is when you plug something in, if the power draw off of this unit drops below 40 watts, then this unit will shut down to save power because of course anything that is plugged into the AC side of the unit that's left plugged in there unnecessarily is going to drain the battery even when it's not running because if there is power from the batteries going through the AC inverter that is being wasted if it's not being delivered to something else. So that is the standard default. However, it does have a downside. If you have small devices like cell phones and maybe cameras and tablets and even smaller devices that require a, a, a longer recharge time because they have very small wattage draws, then you're going to want to change it from the eco mode to the standard mode and then it will just continue to run regardless. Great for doing cell phones and batteries and flashlights and things like that. But there's also the power lifting mode and that power lifting mode will allow you to power things up to 2,000 watts. Now this has a 1,000 watt inverter, meaning that it will run electrical devices requiring 1,000 watts of power. We'll tell you, I'll tell you in a few moments how you can determine if your devices have that type of a draw. But there are some devices which will need a starting energy higher than 1,000 watts. So this has that surge capacity of up to 2,000 but it can also be set to a 2000 watt power lifting mode, meaning that if you have devices that run at higher than 1000 watts, you can run them off of this device. However, there is a few conditions. Number one, they have to be a resistive load. It can't be things with motors or things that require the power to go up and down. And I'll give you examples of what I tried that does work and doesn't work on that in a moment. So having those three de power delivery modes is great. Now the unit also has three charging speeds. The standard charging speed, the turbo, and the silent. Now the standard is exactly that. And it, there's a certain amount of time if you want to take it to zero to 100%, how long, and I'll have that information in the video description if you're interested, how long does it take this unit to recharge from zero using AC wall current and using the standard charging mode. And there's also a turbo, which means that you can turn it on turbo charging. The unit will charge extremely quickly, up to 80% in a very short period of time. And then it starts to slow down as it reaches towards the 100%, which is great if you think you're going to need your power more quickly than the standard mode will deliver. However, there is a, stand, a downside to using the turbo charging. And that is when you're putting that much energy into these batteries at a very fast rate, it does shorten their lifespan. Not once or twice over the long term. So if you had to do it a few times, that's what it's there for. But I wouldn't make that your regular practice of charging this unit using turbo. In fact, I'm using the last method, which is silent. Silent is often referred to as the overnight mode or the silent mode. And it's silent for a reason. The, the device doesn't make any sound because it is much more slowly charging the batteries, more slowly than the standard will. And it does take longer to reach full capacity on the batteries. And that's why I say it's the overnight mode. It's one of those things, if you're not going to need this right away, but you do want to charge it up, just plug it in, put it on silent, let it recharge nice and slow. It'll be ready for you when you need it, if you give it long enough and you have lengthened the life of the batteries by doing that. So for me, that's what I have set as my default is the silent. And if I don't need it to charge quickly, it's on silent. It just makes it uh, last that much longer. Now, this unit has a UPS function mode with a very fast switching time rated at about 20 milliseconds. What's that all about? UPS stands for uninterrupted power supply. So in this power or in this storm, uh, one of the things that you would, I would like to keep running, it's not necessary, but it's, it is one of those things that does make life in, in when you're stuck in the house a little bit more pleasant, is to have my internet constantly up and running. So when I finish this video, I'm going to be plugging this into the wall current for AC to make sure this is staying fully charged. I'll, I'll plug the power bar for my computer and Wi-Fi and all the associated devices into this. 
the AC wall current will continue to operate the computer as long as it needs to, but if there's a power failure, immediately, within 20 milliseconds, this it will switch over to the batteries in this, and I won't even notice that it's happened. So my computer won't blink, it won't go off, it won't do anything. It'll just keep running as if nothing ever happened, no interruptions, and then I won't lose my uh, internet and whatever work that I'm doing, like video editing, a lot of the times, maybe even video editing for this video is could be what I'm doing at the same time. So that is a great feature. The unit also has a Bluetooth app, so I do have that installed on my phone. I use it for setting the things like power lifting and charging modes, that type of thing. It's a great thing to have so you can do so remotely. Now you don't have to use a Bluetooth app to do this. There is a sequence of button presses on the unit itself which will allow you to make the same changes but it's nice to be able to do it from a distance. Also allows you to check the status of your battery from a distance. You don't have to be looking at the front screen to see how much power is being delivered, how much is going in, and how much is actually installed in the unit itself. Last but not least is the warranty for Blue Weddy products. Five years, industry leading five-year warranty on Bluetic products. They stand behind them. I've, I've had great customer service and great communications dealing with Bluetic, and that's one of the reasons why I feel Bluetic may well be the very best, I, actually I will say the very best of all the power stations available on the market, at least for everything that I have tested so far. All right, let's take a look at the physical specs for this unit and then we'll get into the performance after that. So wait, yes, it is heavier than the little AC2A. This unit comes in at 22.55 pounds or 10.2 kilograms. Now that's mitigated by a nice built-in handle here on the back. So it's really, it's not that bad to carry. It just makes it quite easy to move around and carry it about the house or wherever you need to take it. You know, and it's not even too big to take car camping. It's just that it's a little big, right? With everything else that you're going to be packing when you go away, unless you need this much power, maybe you don't want to take something this big. That's where the small one, the AC2A, comes in. But it's, you know, if you have the space and you want the power capability, this will deliver it, and it's still portable. All right, so overall, in its width, it is 12.4 inches, 314 millimeters. Height, top to bottom, 10.1 inches, 255.8 millimeters. Depth front to back, 8.2 inches, 209.5 millimeters. Now it uses the lithium iron phosphate batteries that have a estimated life cycle of 4,000 plus life cycles. That's a zero to 100% recharge. It's estimated to be at about 10 years of normal use. Some people uh, will probably last much longer. And even after that 4,000 cycles, it doesn't mean the unit's no good. It just means the batteries start to hold less charge. At both that point, they start to drop words of 80% of their original capacity. So you're still getting all kinds of power just not as much as it has when it's brand new. All right, I brought the camera in a little closer so you can get some detailed look at the AC70 as we uh, go through some more detail on it. Specifically, let's go through the performance specifications for this unit. So let's talk about input. So there are two means of putting power into this unit. The primary one, of course, is the AC power uh, plug on this side and I showed you the cable a minute ago. That's where it will uh, plug in and it will accept 120 volts up to 850 watts at 4.8 amps input there. So that's the AC input but at the same time it also has a DC input right up here using the XT90 connector. This is where you would plug in either your solar panels or your auto power cord into this unit and you'll be able to deliver additional power. Here it will accept between 12 volt and 58 volt upwards of 500 watts at 10 amps using the XT90 connector. Now you can put power in from both sides at the same time. So you can have it plugged into the wall and you can have solar power or auto power plugged into here if you want to get that much power going into this unit for the fastest recharge possible. But you are limited to 1000 watt max input. But that's, that's a lot of power going into this unit. It will bring you up to full capacity in very short order. Now as far as output goes, I'll 
I'm going to show you all the ports in a minute. But as far as output goes, you have a battery capacity of 768 watt hours. You have an AC inverter that will deliver up to 1,000 watts of AC power, 120 volt, 2.5 amps. It has a surge capacity of 1,500 watts. But as I mentioned, it also has that power lifting mode, which will take it up to 2,000 watts. Now, that is a, I'm going to call it a Blue Eddy magic and how they arrive at that because what they're doing in order to get the extra wattage to go out, they're actually dropping the voltage. So it's not something I would do on a regular basis. I did test it out on a few home appliances here and we'll talk about those in a few minutes time. So while you have a thousand watts of continual output, 1500 watts of surge and some devices need that initial startup surge you can run things upwards of 2000 watts for a shorter period of time I will qualify it that they have to be resistive loads and probably the best example I have is I use my electric kettle as a test item and again I'll talk about that in a moment so that is the power output specifications now let me share the ports on this and here's what's interesting they are virtually identical to the smaller brother the AC2A there's one additional port which I'll point out in a minute so to begin we have the two AC ports over here each working at 120 20 volt 2.5 amps 60 hertz over on this side we have the auto output port it will put out 12 volt dc 10 amps we have two usb a output ports on the the front of the unit in the center they will deliver up to 12 watts 5 volts at 2.4 amps there's also two usb type c output ports each delivering up to 100 watts ranging between 5 and 12 volts and 3 and uh, 5 amps output so a lot of power that you can put out you can charge multiple devices at the same time with this unit without any worry of, of using all the power that's in this. All right, let's move into the operation of this unit. All right, let's start going through the operation of the AC70. And again, just like the AC2A, very simple to operate, in fact, identical to the AC2A. And this is what Bluetti does so well. They make the operation of this easy to understand, intuitive to follow. And the thing that I think makes Bluetti stand out over all the other brands, at least the ones that I have tested, is the graphical display that I'll show you momentarily. So let's get started. So right in the center, underneath the display panel are three buttons. The center panel is the overall on and off button. So I'll press that now. This powers up the unit before anything is plugged into it. It gives me a status check. It's telling me how much capability or capacity is still left in this. And I believe it's saying 76%. So I have 76% of my battery capacity still available to me. Now, not only am I getting a percentage of that, but I'm also getting a graphical representation with that segmented circle around the outside. Not only that, probably small to see, but right underneath the percentage is a amount of time left on this battery. Now, that's showing 99.9 .9 hours right now, but there's no load plugged in. In a moment, I'm going to plug a load in, a fan, a heater fan, in fact. We'll do some experimenting with that. And once the load is plugged in, that will calculate how long I'll be able to run the fan at, rather in fan mode or in heater mode. Either way, as you can see, it's, well, we'll talk about, well, you'll see it in operation. You'll understand what I mean in a moment. Now, on either side, is the DC and the AC operation. So at the top, you have DC input. Oh, and that's the other thing you do every once in a while. If you don't have anything plugged into it, you have to re-touch it to bring the screen back up. It's just a power saving mode. So you have the DC input and the DC output. On this side, you have the AC input and the AC output. So let's start by doing exactly that. We're going to plug in the AC power to start the unit charging. And you can see on the side here, oh, by the way, this is a good opportunity to point out one more thing that I failed to show you a minute ago, and that is this, a grounding screw. So it's nice to have. I don't know how often I'll use it, but if you see yourself in a situation where you want to have this unit grounded to prevent shocks, to prevent uh, short circuiting of the unit, it's nice to have a grounding screw there. Now, there is where the AC unit is going to plug in. We'll put that in the unit. Bring it back around 
and almost immediately you should start to see power starting to be delivered to the unit. At the top right up there, it is showing the input power and that's coming from grid. There's also a little symbol on the bottom or word there that says grid saying that the input is coming from grid powder, meaning house AC current right now. All right, so the unit is now charging off of the AC unit. But what I want to do is plug in this heater fan and show you that drawing the load on it. But before I do that, I'm just going to back the camera up a little bit so you can get both of them in the shot. All right, I backed the camera up so that you can see me using this heater fan right here. Uh, I don't know if I pointed this out, but one of the things that the information on the screen shows me is 269 watts of power going into this unit. But at number at the bottom that I mentioned a minute ago will show me how long the battery is going to last with the load plugged in. Right now is indicating how long it will be before the battery comes up to full charge. And it's showing me right now about six hours. So at the silent input that's what it takes for this unit to go from 76 to up 100 percent is six hours if i wanted to put it on standard turbo it'd be a much much shorter time all right let's plug in an ac unit on this just to show you a load now in order to do that the first thing i have to do is turn the ac on the ac delivery on and that is make sure i'm pressing the right thing is the AC button. So if I press that now, a little symbol comes up on the screen that says AC. And now I can plug in the unit, in this case, the heater fan, plug it in correctly. I don't want the cable covering up the device. Now, I'm going to tell you that this fan draws a lot of power when it's used as a heater, but I'll start by putting the fan on in just that fan mode. And we, this will, it has no problem running a fan. So this is low fan mode. And I apologize now for the noise or the sound that this is going to generate. But already I can start to see the draw on this unit from the fan. I'm going to turn it up to high. Obviously, the draw goes up, but it's a fan. All right, great in the summertime, not so great right now. The room I'm in in my house, let me just turn that off for a moment. The room I'm in my house recording this is in my basement, and this time of year, it is not well heated. In fact, I use this to keep this room warm enough for me to operate and do things in, like making videos. So this has a fair amount of power to or heat to deliver, but that comes at a cost. It can be dr quite a draw. I believe this is about a 1250 watt uh, heater uh, fan. Well, let's just see what happens. I'm going to turn it on low. And uh, here's the thing. If it draws more current than the unit is capable of delivering, it'll just stop. It's like a circuit breaker. It'll just shut down and everything will shut. You'll have to turn the whole unit off and turn it back on again. I have it in power lifting mode. My experience has been is power lifting mode will give me the required wattage to operate this unit but it doesn't like it. I'll tell you that it makes an odd sound. So that's because it's not only a resistive load. It has heating elements, which are resistive, but it also has a motor, which is not just resistive. So let me just turn on the low heat. We'll let that run for a moment. So I'm reading 834 watts running on low heat. Let's turn it on. I, I, I actually expect this is probably going to trip the circuit breaker, but let's have a look and see what happens. <coughs> there we go. Right away, the circuit breaker trip, just because this will draw more power then this is capable of being delivered. And I think that was just a good demonstration. That's not a fault of this device. It's just a mismatch between what I'm trying to use and what the device is capable of delivering power to. So I think that's a good demonstration. All right, it, the unit is continuing to charge. I'm glad of that because the storm is worsening outside. Once it's charged up, I'm gonna be bringing it upstairs and plugging my computer into it so that I know I have that at least running in case the power failures. But in the meantime, before we do that, let's just wrap this video up with a few more comments on the AC70 and sharing my experiences using it. All right, I've spoken about the AC70 
370 long enough. Let me just give you some of my experiences in testing this out and using it prior to making this video. So when this unit first arrived about three weeks ago, the first thing I did is I wanted to start plugging things into it to see what it would run and what it would not run. Now I had an idea before I started the types of things that it would and wouldn't run based on my experience with other power stations and the like. Plus I bought this unit some time ago and this is a power meter which allows me to plug it into the wall or into an extension cord and then plug devices into this and give me an idea of just how much power those units will draw. So I've done that before and I did it again. I just went around the house taking a look at all the devices. The devices that I felt were most important to have operational should the power go down here. And oh, let me share with you what I found. Now, not all of these were essential, of course, but uh, the lot I just, well, some of them were just there and I wanted to test them out anyway. Obviously, my computer now, my computer system is not essential by any means, but it's a nice thing to have when the power goes down to stay in touch with the world and everybody on the outside. This unit easily powered my computer, the speakers, the printer, the Wi-Fi, the rotor, everything. It had no issue, including a lamp that I have running beside the whole setup. So I have no issue with this running the computer and everything else. So that was not an issue at all. But I wanted to see what else it would run. So I went around and I tested, first off, kitchen appliances. Now, kitchen appliances can really range in the power draws. I tested my toaster, not essential, nice to have, but not essential, about 830 watts. That wasn't too bad. I tested my coffee maker, again, about 830 watts. Actually, uh, no, it was a 1,200-watt a, a draw, but when I put this unit on power lifting, it dropped the draw to about 930 watts. What does that mean? Well, what it does is it makes the uh, coffee maker, it's one of the larger coffee makers, a little slower to operate, and the water didn't get quite as hot. You know what that means to me? I'm not going to use that in a power failure, but I don't have to. I've got so many other ways of making coffee around the house that I can make a good cup of coffee as long as I can get hot water. So I plugged the kettle in. Now, the electric kettle is a purely resistive load. That's great. Now, what I did is I found that it will draw upwards of 1,300 watts um, when it's operational. So using this device off of the wall current, I can see it operates 1300 watts. That's going to be more than the 1000 watt delivery that the AC70 can do. But if I put it on power lifting mode, it will work. And it does. It brings it up to... Now, Again, here's the Blue Wedding Magic. It delivers about the, or it operates the kettle at about 900 watts, 875, I think it was, watts. That actually is not an issue. What it did do is it just took longer to bring the water to boiling. So it didn't heat the water as quickly, but it did heat it up to boiling. I think the kettle is one of those things I'd call almost essential. Again, I have lots of ways of heating water, but it's nice to know I can heat water with my kettle, electric kettle, if I wanted to. I tried the microwave. The microwave is an 1100 watt uh, inverter microwave. I had plugged the unit into this and found that it took 1560 watts, I think it is, to operate the microwave. I plugged the microwave into the AC70. Now, it tripped the switch pretty quickly. So the microwave is off of the menu as far as devices you can operate. Now, things that don't draw a lot of power which are essential, at least I have found in my experience in past power failures, are things like my fridge and my freezer. Those will operate off of this quite easily, not for an extended period of time, but long enough. Now, they, they, the way they work, of course, is they will come on, the compressor will come on, draw the energy out of the battery, cool the fridge or the freezer off, then they shut themselves down. And then they'll do that every so often, depending on how warm it is in the house, wherever those are located. So it will operate your fridge and freezer for at least a number of hours. And if your power failure is going to go longer than that, well, then you're going to have to look at an other alternative. And uh, there's lots of discussion about how that can be uh, done. So those are the things I do consider essential. Lights around the house, you know, they're all LED. None of them draw very much power. Always have lighting in the house with a battery like this. That's a good thing to know as well always have all my devices charged as well. Now, here's one I tested that I was pleasantly surprised how well it worked and how useful this is, and that is an old-fashioned slow cooker or crock pot. Uh, we have a couple of crock pots of different sizes. They don't draw very much power at all. What's the benefit of that? Well, if you're in a power outage and you're looking to heat food up, 
uh, it takes a while in a crock pot, even on high, to heat uh, frozen foods up. Or if you have things in the refrigerator, you just want to reheat for a meal. Crock-Pot is actually a really good choice. It's something worth having. They're inexpensive to buy. Have them, use them, and then when the power goes out, they are a great item to use with a power station like this. Even a smaller power station than this will operate your Crock-Pot. All right, those are my experiences using this. I really like this unit for exactly what I've mentioned, that is prep in case of a power failure, uh, which, again, we could still have during this snowstorm that we're having even now. But you know, this is not so big that I couldn't take this camping. In fact, when Gina looked at it, and we are planning our next summer's camping trip, she goes, we should take that with us. And I said, yeah, we could. I'd like to take the smaller one, but there's nothing wrong with taking this and a 200 watt uh, solar panel. And we'd be in power with a small electric fridge forever, virtually, as long as we have lots of sunshine, that is. Okay, that's everything I wanted to share with you about the AC70. Again, very much like the AC2A. I'm going to put a link to the video review of the AC2A at the end of this video in case you're interested in that smaller unit. I'm going to put all the information I delivered to you in the video description below. If you have any comments or questions regarding the AC70, put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.